chaque, chaque fois que je viens en France, euh, j'essaie de parler français, mais les Français parlent mieux anglais que moi. So, so instead, I tend to speak in English, because that makes things easier for everybody. So, uh, yeah, here we've got a problem, because the clicker's not on the right thing. Hang on. Oh, no. Ah, technology fail. Sorry about this. I need to share the desktop. I'm, I'm not pointing to the right thing, because that's on there. Can we just do that thing where, sorry, where it's mirrored, where it's the same thing, rather than, oh, was that going to work? Ah, brilliant. Thank you. There you go. I work in computers. I don't know how they work. Right. Uh, who am I? So I'm James. Thank you for the introduction. I've been working for ThoughtWorks for three years now. Um, most of what we do at ThoughtWorks, or most of what I've done at ThoughtWorks, has been in places where they're in trouble. We do agile transformation type work. We do a lot of work where companies are sort of in a bit of a mess, really. And that tends to be the sort of thing that I've worked in. I've worked on a lot of successful projects that have done things really well. And uh, I'll tell you a bit later about one that wasn't particularly successful. For those that haven't heard of ThoughtWorks, I won't spend too much time on this, but we're an international uh, consultancy. You may have heard of some famous people that work for ThoughtWorks, Martin Fowler, James Lewis works for the UK office, and it was James that actually invented, or is reputed to have invented the term microservices. Lots and lots of people from ThoughtWorks have written lots and lots of books. If you look at this slide closely enough, there's one about microservices there. Uh, I've read some of these books. I've been to some of these book launches. Um, I haven't written a book yet myself. So what did I find in Nantes? Uh, I think Nantes is a really nice place. My wife asked me to take lots of photographs because my wife came to Nantes for a year at university. So I thought this photo sort of looks, that to me, that looks so French. I think it's fantastic. Um, I didn't know that Nantes was part of the slave trade. I think there's a fantastic um, monument to the, to the slave trade there to, um, down on the side of the river. I uh, spent a lot of time there this morning. I, it's wonderful to see. Here's the conference. Uh, I'd love to know what this building is. It looks like an old train shed. I, I don't know if it is or not, but I, I might research it. I love architecture. So I love taking photos of buildings, and it just intrigued me that the... It's clearly some sort of post-industrial building, but I'd love to know what it was at one time. Oh, yeah, now this. In, whenever I go abroad, I always think I'm going to get run over by cars because, of course, we in the UK, well, I would say we drive on the right side of the road. People in other countries would say we drive on the wrong side of the road. These road markings just scared me. I just thought, what on earth does that mean? <laughs> can I cross? Can I not? And I was paralyzed by fear. It was just so confusing. Uh, that's this building. I've, again, I've, I love it. it uh, I know Bois means wood, I think, in French. So I've, uh, I don't know what Atlan means, whether, whether Atlan Bois means anything. Uh, again, I'll look it up, but it's a lovely looking building. Um, for those, I went to this talk earlier. Um, it wasn't this talk, actually. I went to the talk on quantum. Um, and I discovered a quantum effect because uh, it was in French. They, we had the little translation headphones, and I discovered that they could simultaneously work and not work, which was obviously something to do with the talk that was going on. And, uh, but then I, I didn't understand it any less when I didn't understand the language that he was saying, to be honest. <laughs> so that's quantum for you. Uh, and that, Oh, yeah, that's me with the, the translating headphone thingies on. Anyway, what am I actually going to talk about? Um, so we, we at ThoughtWorks have written and done a lot of work on microservices the last few years. When I actually proposed this talk um, about six months ago, um, we have this mechanism at ThoughtWorks where when we get invited to come to a conference, we have to ask, uh, we have to put an email to this list of people that then, it's a rubber stamping exercise uh, just to get the time off because um, it's part of our job. But this title, Microservice is Not Worth the Trouble, sort of got escalated up. And I had one of the head of UTA technology phoning me and saying, what are you going to talk about? You know, you, you, this can't be contrary to ThoughtWorks core messaging. It was the first time that had ever happened to me. I thought, yeah, um, I better make sure I don't uh, diss microservices. So um, 
I'm going to talk a bit about complexity, um, and then the main part of the talk is, is, is talking about the outcomes that we want from what we're doing, rather than starting with an implementation and then going through that. We'll talk about that a bit more, but essentially what I'm arguing for is, is to understand the outcomes you need rather than uh, start to uh, specify a solution, which is, which is what microservices is. Um, so, let's crack on. What, what, what's the microservices promises? Why would one want to use microservices? So, um, there's a lots, lots of reasons why. Um, microservices, from my understanding, is, is, is kind of a response to traditional architectures where various teams were always getting in each other's way, trying to get stuff done. And microservices really, one, one of the key things that it promises is to try and uh, reduce handovers between teams. Handovers are expensive. Uh, Conway's law, which I can never remember exactly how it was put down, but um, my colleague James Lewis knows better than me, but Conway said something along the lines of the, uh, the systems your company builds will reflect the communications um, mechanisms within your company. So you end up, teams build the stuff that they use and then the real boundaries between people become real boundaries between bits of software. So the idea with microservices is to understand what those sensible boundaries should be and to build the systems according to that and build the teams according to that. Uh, it promises independent scalability of components. This can be useful particularly for large-scale websites. Um, you know, the sales bit might be much busier than the bit that takes other, you know, organizers' deliveries, whatever. So independent scalability is important. Um, I think a massive key thing about microservices is this, the, the notion of being able to release your code uh, when you want to, without having to worry about release trains, without having to get other things going. Um, you should reduce some complexity in your components. Uh, it allows for techn technology diversity. I'm still dubious about this point, technology diversity. It comes up in a lot of talks. People say, oh, you can use the best technology for the, for the job. Uh, yeah, but one other thing that happens, which I'll mention later, is that sometimes you use whatever technology your devs think is cool, which is not necessarily a great outcome. Um, it can help to reduce system downtime if you've got a good system. Uh, uh, that last bullet, to be honest, oops, what's going on? Sorry about this. I'm talking for too long between slides, obviously. Uh, it helps to enable platform thinking. I still don't quite understand what that means, but I got told by my previous tech principal that I need to put that in there. Right, I'm going to talk about complexity briefly. Uh, one promise that people think about is that if they use microservices, they'll get some kind of win in terms of complexity. So uh, I'm going to illustrate this with, with a diagram, and I actually ripped this off from a conference I went to in Berlin last year. The chap was talking about the mathematics of complexity. Imagine you've got a system with five things in it. Now, if all of these five things aren't constrained to communicate with one another, you've got uh, 10 possible connections, 10 possible channels, 10 possible things that can be going on. So if you add another thing to this system, and I'm deliberately being vague in what this is, it could, they could be classes, they could be modules, whatever. Uh, add one more thing, you've, you add five more possible connections. So you can see the, it's order of n squared, I think, isn't it? The, the absolute complexity you're going to get to there. Um, n, n minus one over two possible connections. So if you've got 16 things, then you've got up to 120 connections, but I couldn't draw that because, you know, my computer ran out of memory. So if I use microservices, can I reduce this complexity? Well, let's think about this. So let's say I've got 16 things, and we know from the previous slide there's 120 possible connections. What if I group them into contexts? So now I've got four contexts. Now oh, the colors are a bit washed out on there, never mind. So, and then I only allow connections between the related things in the context and between the contexts themselves. So now I'm down to a maximum of 31 things that I care about, 31 interactions. So, have I reduced the complexity? Uh, well, I don't know. In the interest of political balance, I've got Obama there. I suppose I should use Trump now, find a picture of Trump, but he wasn't voted in when I put this together. Would all the things really connect to the other things? Probably not. You know, just because you've got 16 things in your system, they're not going to talk to each other. Um, they're probably only, with any sensible design, going to be talking to the 
the things they're related to anyway. Um, and in that other picture, I've only drawn one connection between the context. Well, the, nothing in a microservices architecture constrains you from having many connections between contexts, however, however that's uh, done. And I think the key point that I'm trying to drive out here is that you could well be introducing other complexity. And I think for me as a software developer, um, I find it really hard to trace things through the system. Well, and this is part of the microservices thing. The complexity is still there. You've just shifted it somewhere differently. And I think a key point is that what one needs to understand is that you've, you've shifted that complexity into a place that's harder to reason with. If, if you have a monolithic system with all its drawbacks, it's pretty easy to debug your code. You can just step through, see messages being passed from class to class. You can examine the state of things. But if those states live in entirely separate systems and entirely separate microservices, you've introduced a whole level of complexity. So um, here's a quote. Uh, I'll give you a moment to read it. Uh, it's not a famous quote. You've, you may have read it, because I think it's part of the synopsis for this talk. Uh, it's a quote that I made up last year, um, but essentially that's, that's my point. You, you can't reduce the complexity in any given system, whether it be a software system, a physical system. You can just move it around. The, the complexity, I think, is inherent in the, in the problem domain. The solution domain can only minimize against that. So, I think I've made all these points. Let me see. Uh, so. Yeah, you've moved the complexity. This, this is a key point, I think. A lot of people talk about how your microservice is going to be small enough. Um, there's various different definitions of what small enough means. So each service probably will be quite easy to reason with. But do they really do anything useful on their own? They, they often don't, or at least in my experience. So I think the biggest thing that I've seen, the biggest problem is this notion of orchestration between components. You need to get them to do something useful. What sort of patterns do you use for that? You, you've introduced a RabbitMQ or Kafka or something like that, which, you know, with all the will in the world, is quite tough to reason with. It's quite, it's quite hard for all your devs to, to work out what's going on. Your testing becomes a massive pain. You know, how do you write end-to-end -end tests now? You need, you need a way of writing a test that spans dozens, potentially, of microservices. Um, you're going to have more technologies in play. When I first put this talk together, I'd been working on a microservices project for a couple of months. And I counted all the different languages that were in play. So there was Java, there was JavaScript, there was Ruby, there were various bits of um, Golang. Uh, and that language that's based on Java that, that uh, Jenkins uses, which I can't remember what it's called. And, and there were like, there was like 15, 20 technologies. There was um, Chef, there was Docker, there was uh, something called Capistrano that I've never seen before and I hope I never see again, which was orchestrating releases. All this stuff to learn. Um, and you've got to buy into monitoring and uh, maintenance. It, it's, your, your costs are going to go exponential. So. So this is the main part of what I'm going to talk about. What, if we go think about what I said right at the start, about outcomes that can be got arrived at through microservices. So I think it's important, if you're ever in a situation where somebody says, right, we're going to do this, and we're going to do it with microservices, first take a step back and say, OK, what outcomes do we actually want? Why are we doing this? Do you realize the cost that's going on? So there are some great outcomes. So, what are they? So, handovers. Uh, I, I apologize for the artwork on this slide. It's something that I did. We have this thing in ThoughtWorks called ThoughtWorks Glyphs. If you go to our website, you'll see there's lots of art made with these pictures. There's like eight graphics, and we have to combine them and use them. So anyway, what am I saying here? Handovers are bad. This, imagine she on the left is trying to give this piece of paper to her on the right. If the piece of paper gets wet, it will lose fidelity, the message will be lost. So that what, I'm, what I'm trying to conceptually model here is, is a handover. It could be a physical hand, it could be a handing over some code, it could be a conversation, it could be anything else. If the two people are in the same team, which I'm modeling here, uh, it's easy. They're literally, in my picture, in the same boat. They have empathy with one another, they're, they're both working towards the same goal. That handover is going to be easy. And I think 
you can probably see that that's, that's something that should be aimed for. If there does have to be a handover, maybe from a dev to a QA, it makes so much more sense if they're in the same team. You know, it makes so much more sense if they both understand the goals that are going on. It's going to be a lot smoother. You've got a sort of second level handover here. So in this case, she's trying to give the piece of paper to her. They're both in boats. They kind of understand one another's situation. But they may not, uh, they're probably aligned on goals, but they're, they're in a different team. So perhaps, I think this reminds me of a situation that I used to have in my old job years ago where we had a database team and we had uh, a development team. So we had to have communication between us and the database team. We were all aligned on goals, but they, were, they weren't in the same team. They had slightly separate priorities. They had slightly separate views. So, you know, you could say if, if the thing on the left takes minutes or, or hours, the thing on the right is going to be days or weeks, maybe. Then you've got a third type of handover. Now, we called this a transactional handover. Um, now, in this situation, she needs to give the piece of paper to her. Now, you can see this is meant to be a submarine. I hope that's obvious. Um, it isn't a boat that's sunk. Um, in order for her to now hand the piece of paper over, not only does she need to know where the submarine is, she needs to arrange a time for the submarine to surface, she needs to arrange a location for the submarine to surface, and they have to coordinate and they have to link together, they have to get it all done between them. We call this a transactional handover. Um, this type of thing happens, um, I guess, between a, a consultancy company and its client, so we unfortunately have to get involved in this type of stuff occasionally. But rather disturbingly, almost every client I've worked at for ThoughtWorks over the last three years, and I think I've worked at five or six major clients, this stuff happens internally. People refuse to do stuff for another team unless they've got the right paper, the right stuff, the right documentation, and there's this whole massive box ticking exercise that goes on. So you want to minimize that type of handover if you can. So microservices should help you to get there. Uh, you know, the business people should be aligned with the, um, the technology people and, and things should go a lot better. This is a key benefit of microservices. Uh, no team should block any other team's release. I think uh, there's presumably quite a lot of devs in the room. Um, we've all had this where you want to do a release and somebody else from a more important team says, no, you can't do that release. Because uh, my code, my bit of the code, if you release that, it's going to break the website and you can't break the website. So you can't do that release. So you end up coordinating in lockstep all your releases. So if you can, if you can get away with that, that's great. Um, so if you split your monolithic code base by contexts, which is kind of what microservices is starting to do, then uh, that should help with that. Um, consider not splitting data contexts. Yeah, this is an important point. I'm come back to this in one of my case studies. Uh, people have a big arguments over whether your microservices should contain all their data. Um, and I guess, strictly speaking, according to the James Lewis definition, they should. Um, but it is hard. <laughs> um, but the database would not typically form part of a release. It might do, and it might not. So yeah, if you can release your code, that's the main thing. Uh, you might have to do coordination with other teams with microservices. I mean, if you've split your context really well, hopefully you won't, but sometimes a feature spans microservices, then you're kind of in a position where you're all going to have to release things at a certain point, although you can get around that with feature flags. Um, applications can be deployed to the same servers. Right, so what I'm saying there is even if, even if you don't go the full microservices approach where you've got everybody has their own hardware and it's all Phoenix environments, you, you can still get the benefit of releasing just your stuff. It doesn't matter if it's sitting on the same physical server uh, or even the same virtual server as some other team's stuff. This is an outcome that's often trumpeted. How I want to independently scale my components. Uh, to be honest, I think I've never really seen this done in the implementations I've been involved in. It could be because I've typically been involved in a project in the early stages before it grows and scales out. Uh, I've been involved in one where we did have this capability, but we never really used it. Um, so yeah, it's an outcome that you should be looking for. If someone says, well, I want to independently scale, well, microservices could be an answer to that. Um, and again, there's a key point there is your app servers that access, they could all be accessing the same database, but one app server may have more load than another app server. So it doesn't necessarily need to be a full microservices implementation to get this benefit. Um, 
One thing that microservices definitely delivers is strong module boundaries. It, it segregates the contexts. It should make things, if you're working, if you're doing some work in the sales space, it should be more obvious which code base you need to look at. Um, but, yeah, microservices kind of enforce strong module boundaries, but they're not vital to strong module boundaries. You can still have a well-designed code base um, that has well-defined modular boundaries without going for a, a full microservices implementation. What are the downsides? I love this building, by the way. I searched for microservices buildings. It's somewhere in Spain. It was, it was designed as a modular building. Apparently, they constructed all the blocks and, and put them all together in one place. And that's why I chose that picture. Not my picture. But there you go. Oh, well, yeah, I made it pink. OK. So what are the costs? Um, there is on, oh, look at that. I've got a link to it. On Martin Fowler's blog, uh, or Blicky, as he likes to call it, for those that aren't from ThoughtWorks, and I know I can see at least one person in this room that is from ThoughtWorks. Uh, Martin um, calls it a Blicky because he socializes it with the rest of us in ThoughtWorks and asks for loads of opinions about, uh, about these posts before he puts them live. And then he generally ignores everything everybody says and, and posts what he was going to post anyway. Uh, or occasionally there'll be a howl of protest about stuff and he'll come back and say, well, I'll, I'll rework the article. Um, so he claims he socializes it with us. Anyway, uh, there was one about the microservices premium. Uh, I recommend you go and have a read of it because it, it's a great read. These are some of the things that are going to happen to you. You need to have proper automated deployments. This is like a stage zero. If you don't have a pipeline and a CI, CD pipeline, forget it. You, you, you ain't going to get to a microservices state. Uh, you need to have proper monitoring. I mean, I just started work this week, actually, with a new client, and um, when I got to the office, there was no monitoring anywhere. I said to this team, how do you know when things go wrong? And they say, well, somebody shouts at us. Oh, God. Um, you need to understand about dealing with failure. What you've now introduced, you've got, say, the last place I was at, there were 32, I think, microservices. You need to start understanding what, what it means if one piece of the system is unavailable. You need to understand how to, I think it's called, degrade the failure so that um, you, um, you know, if, if this one piece goes down here, you need to know what to do with it. Because if, if, if somebody can't check out, that obviously means you can't sell, but that shouldn't bring down the whole website. You know, if, if you can't order a delivery method, uh, in theory, you probably can't fully check out, but there, there should be some way of getting you close to that and, and the website should still work. Uh, but you've got to understand all that. Uh, eventual consistency, this is the biggest problem that we had on the last project I worked on. What this means is if you have, um, oh, I've done it again. If you have uh, separate, if all of your microservices have their own data store, then um, uh, you have to decide whether a single source of truth matters. You have to decide how to get the data from one place to the other. And it, it, the reason why we call it eventual consistency is because uh, it, it's exactly that. It, it may, there may be a time delay involved. There may be that certain microservices don't have all the data they need, whatever. So you need to really carefully consider how, you're gonna, how your data layers are going to work. And frankly, that's why I think not splitting the database in certain cases is, has been really useful. Uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, developer complexity. All those different technologies that we had at the on my last job was, was ridiculous, and I, I, my head spun with it. Although I did get to learn closure, which was nice. Um, and then this thing, complexity of service to service communication. Are you going to use Rabbit? Are you going to use HTTP? Are you going to use uh, something like Kafka? You know, some sort of CQRS type stuff. Oh, uh, good luck on understanding all that and being able to reason with it. Uh, and then you've got this, this is a sort of hardware consideration, but all this stuff that goes on when you say, right, now the services need to talk to one another, how do I authenticate from service to service? Do I have one service user? Do I, do I somehow pass through the end user's credentials through the system? What do I do? How do I manage that? And then, um, and then you've got to start getting certificates. They could be expensive. And you've got to open firewalls and, you know, oof. again, it gets painful. Um, why is my computer shaking? Uh, okay, these are some of the things that can go wrong. Uh, I've got another slide on this, so I'm not going to dwell too much on this. My point about that is, uh, yeah, that car park's in a bit of a mess, isn't it? 
Um, why is it shaking? Key, key point there, I think, is, is, is on funding. Uh, if you don't ongoingly fund your products, your microservices architecture can decay, and I've seen that happen. Uh, and beware, and this is a counterpoint that I've heard people raise, does microservices not just create more silos? Yeah, it can do. And if you're not careful, those silos could be as destructive as technology-based silos. So, you know, you have to be really careful with this. I hope it was just that slight, oh, no, it's all shaking again. Oh, no. It's not just me, is it? Can everybody else see that? <laughs> God, now I'm starting to get worried. Okay. I, um, this is kind of based on the project that I just mentioned. Uh, throughout the lifetime, we ThoughtWorks came in and this was already done. It was already in place. We were taking over from uh, some in-house devs, from some, uh, uh, from some other consultants. What we found was that over time there'd been an inconsistent product vision. People weren't really clear on what the product was trying to do. Uh, and you could see it had the DNA of various tech leads over time in it. You know, so one person was really keen on using RabbitMQ, so you could see that that era. And then somebody else was thinking, well, why don't I use HTTP? Because it, it's just like, you know, it's easier to reason with. I make a call, I see the answer come back. So you could see all that. Um, I think the client has a, a lot to answer for because their requirements kept pivoting. Um, a, a, I think a really interesting point is this, technology-based microservices. There was a microservice, I'm not going to say the name of it, but it had this name which meant nothing. It, uh, it had a three-letter acronym. Not even everybody understood what the acronym stood for. I was working at this client for nine, ten months, and I kept asking different people, what does this do? And I never really got a good answer. And um, I remember having a conversation one day where I said, uh, what's the... Uh, what was the problem to which this was the proposed solution? And he said, oh, it was linearization and scale up and uh, something I can't remember. I said, well, that's not a problem. That's a <laughs> Tell me which business person ever asked for that, made that a requirement. Waterfall funding um, was a massive problem. This company was a government agency and it was only ever given money to implement policy. So the way that the government thinks it works is there's the money for that policy, you've implemented it, that's done. It doesn't understand that you need to carry on funding the infrastructure. Um, inconsistent implementations I've mentioned. And there were some strange, shall we say, technology choices. This company decided to use Clojure for all its new microservices at some point three or four years ago. Uh, and it did that to try and keep developers, to keep them interested, because they felt that if they were teaching them Clojure, it would be a good way to attract staff and keep staff. Uh, but then a lot of the staff uh, learned closure and then got better paid jobs and now they can't hire people because closure devs are too expensive. <laughs> and that's what it felt like to me. <laughs> Oftentimes, I got uh, our cabana to draw a link, uh, a thing showing all the messages from one request and it looked like that it, and it scared me as much as that did. Okay. These are some of the things. I can't leave that story. Um, we were asked to improve it. That's what we're doing. I think a key point is to start getting the right culture in place. DevOps, you build it, you run it. Um, we fought many fights on budgets, and we did manage to get them to, to assign money full time to keep it going. Um, we're in the process of redesigning the microservices so they line with business capabilities. Like that one I mentioned, which is just unfathomable, I'm hoping will die although I'm not on that project anymore, so, uh, but then obviously I still know people that are. Um, aligning teams around the services. We, we were trying to make the services like, be owned by one team because that was a problem. Uh, and we started to try and instill this idea, design for the customer, understand what the customer wants, then yeah, that, that's, that's a key thing. So there was mainly bad, but some good coming in that, and hopefully over time the orange smiley will overtake the, the green sad face. Never quite sure why they're that way around, but it's a st standard ThoughtWorks graphic. Here's a couple of case studies. Um, when I worked, I worked in a startup before ThoughtWorks for nine years. We started my employee number. It was a bit like Mr. Burns out of The Simpsons with his uh, national insurance number. My employee number was one. So um, as the company grew and grew, we obviously got a more and more complex solution uh, and it just sort of evolved over time until sort of five years later we were in a real mess. We were in that situation where my team couldn't do any releases because of the other team. So we wanted to improve this situation. So 
we had an architecture which had evolved and looked vaguely like that, um, which doesn't look too bad. We had about four tech teams at the time, and I was running that team, and we were responsible for all the internal tools, basically everything the company did that wasn't the website. And we had about five business teams. I can't remember. I, I did this slide long after this. Um, now, the, the, the picture gets interesting when you consider what people care about. The web team cared about sort of those bits. We, the tools team, cared about those bits. There's a bit of overlap. That's deliberate. That isn't my bad drawing. Uh, the infrastructure team sort of cared about everything because they were the ones that managed our relationship with the, the data centers. And the database team, well, they cared about the database, but they also cared about the bits that talked to the database because they were keen to make sure that you know, we didn't kill it with performance. Now, what did the actual business teams care about? Well, the sales team, those sort of parts. The partnerships team, those sort of parts. And I won't bore you with the details, but now you can see the picture's really confused and deliberately so. That was the situation we had. In order to get anything done, any of the business teams had to talk to probably all of the tech teams, and then we had to get some sort of lockstep release thing going, and it just ground to a halt. We found that we could not do anything. So, so our problem statement was we need the teams to be able to release their value independently of the other teams. So what did we do? So it, was, it took us maybe, I guess what's being described here, uh, to my recollection, maybe it took us about a year to get to a better place. The first thing to do was to refactor the code base, basically, make it more modular. Um, we were using Microsoft technologies, so NuGet was quite new at the time, so we then started using NuGet, the package manager, to, to help manage those dependencies, to pull them out of the immediate code bases. We split the code base vertically, um, so that you know, there were bits to do with each business team. Um, we made our software teams cross-functional, which put a bit of a stress on resources. Um, but really worked. Um, we didn't do anything to the database, and I remember having lots of arguments about it, an argument that we should have done, but I didn't win those arguments. Um, and we didn't do anything at that time with the infrastructure. So we were still deploying everything onto like a, I think it was a five server cluster. And because it was the old version of IIS before um, .NET Core, uh, you know, you've got the, the app server and the web server are basically the same piece of code, so we just, we just had five boxes. Um, so pictorially, we went from this, which was on the other slide, and we, we, we got to that situation. And hey presto, um, and I think there were other teams as well, but I can't remember what they were, but the essential point is now every team could do its own releases. We were all returning value when, as and when we saw fit, but we still had to negotiate with the database team, which always annoyed me. So. That's what we managed to achieve. That's what we didn't achieve. We didn't have any separate scalability, so you know my bits of the application, which were used far less heavily than the website, had to scale with them, and you know that's something we could have looked at later. Um, particularly, we had really busy periods where we had to scale out, where we had these boxes on standby at uh, rack space. So, um, yeah. Probably would have been better if we could have get to that, uh, but we and we also didn't have bounded data context, so we still had this situation where we had tables in a SQL Server database with like hundreds of columns, and each bit of code only ever like accessed a few, so that was clearly massively inefficient and confusing. But we avoided having to manage eventual data consistency, and we avoided introducing all that extra developer complexity that I mentioned earlier. So I think this one's got a smiley, yeah. One more case study. Uh, last year, throughout the first half of the year, I was working with ThoughtWorks at a publishing company. This company has been in existence for two or three hundred years, and they basically used to publish loads and loads and loads of volumes of stuff which they get sent out to their client, um, and now that's become an application, obviously. Uh, and they've got a really interesting thing where they, they think that creating the content to go into the application is entirely separate from consuming the content. So they've got like two halves of the business. There's this, all of this stuff which is that's full of legacy, and I'll show you on a picture in a moment, to create the content, and then they have this other side, and they never talk to one another, that are building the apps to consume that content. And they had this magic um, roadmap thing, 
that said that on this date in September last year, the content will be done and the app will be done, and then they were expecting to be able to just switch them on and it would work. You can probably guess how that went. But um, anyway, uh, the problem statement given to us was this, 13 months to deliver a new feature, to deliver new value to this product. Can we reduce that cycle time? So this was what it looked like. This is a genuine slide from a showcase. I've, I've anonymized it. What I'm illustrating here is, uh, that's Karen Lee, my colleague, and she had to do what felt like a relatively simple task. And she encountered all these teams, all these things coming on. And oh gosh, then we discovered a new system that we'd never even heard about that controlled this system that we were trying to use, and oh my word. And then we sent some more messages. We discovered some people, I think these people here, these people were in Singapore. We didn't even know the company had an office in Singapore. Um, and then we found some Americans, but we could only communicate with them uh, by email because they were always asleep when we were awake and you know, so on and so on. And, and the whole thing took weeks. So here's what was going on. I think I've already mentioned this. The yellow, are they yellow? I can't really see my colors. Um, that's the sort of content creation, and it all went into this document database. Then there was this, uh, the other side, this code, the US app, was already written, and it was using these shared display services to display this content from this document database onto the end user app. Uh, then they built the UK app that used the same shared display services, and I'd, this was long before we got there, but it was so tightly coupled that in order to release the UK app, which wasn't live yet, they had to release the live US app. <laughs> Brilliant. So, uh, and that was why it was taking so long. So, what did we do? Uh, basically, they asked us to look at content enhancement, which was the thing on the left. We said, we're only doing that if you give us the whole value stream. The value stream starts from when somebody creates something, a document, and it ends when the user consumes it. Give us that whole value stream, we'll start talking. We started asking product-based questions. An amazing thing about silos uh, is that often the people that are involved in the silos, they have a massively accurate understanding of what their bit of technology does. But ask them why it does it, and they do not know. And we kept asking this question of people, OK, you've told us that it adds these tags. They're basically XML documents. It adds these tags. What do these tags do? What functionality do they drive? They didn't know. So essentially, we, we cut across all of those silos and went straight to, to here. We just ignored them. We just understood what they did and then reproduced the functionality ourselves. And then we did the same on that side. We built what we called a microservice, what the client was keen to call a microservice. It was essentially an app that was just being reverse proxied to from the main app. So we could deploy that app on our own, and we showed that we traversed the silos, and we delivered value in 12 weeks. Uh, yeah, that, I think that's what that dotted line's doing. And we reduced the cycle time from 13 months to some days. So what did we achieve? Shorter cycle times, which is great. Um, we did achieve separate scalability because we were deploying our stuff to its own database, its own hardware. We got them focused on the customer, which was a great outcome, which was on the side. I don't think that was strictly to do with microservices. We did impose on ourselves the deployments, um, and we re-engineered rather than reuse code. The client wasn't very happy about that. They felt that we should have been reusing stuff, but I think we demonstrated that you know that's a trade-off. That's uh, and we introduced this monitoring and support overhead. So it was mainly good with a little bit of bad or, oh, and it was still confusing. <laughs> it was still like the road markings. So I'm nearly done. I won't inflict too much more on them. So that, that's my description of how you can get the outcomes. But obviously microservices, we advocate for them. Uh, if you've got the right level of maturity in your organization, you should always consider it. My first tip is, why would you design with microservices from the start? As long as you have a well-designed monolith, it will be easy to break up, and you should strongly consider that. Uh, microservices really start to pay off when you've scaled up massively. Uh, so if, if you're not doing something at massive scale, I don't see why you would do it. You need to understand the cost. I keep talking about this. This is essentially what I'm talking about. So yeah, sit down and work out what it's going to cost you, because it will. You need to have strong technical leadership and consistency throughout the project. If you don't have strong technical leadership, if you let the vision falter, if you let it merge and change over time, you will get in a terrible pickle. 
Um, so however you do that, uh, I think it's, it's essentially a prerequisite. And what you can't have is people collectively owning the architecture because often collective ownership means no ownership. So I'm always wary when, of architecture groups or an architecture committee. Uh, they, they make me scared. Understand the outcomes you want. Sit down and say, well, why do we think microservices? What's the problem to which microservices is the proposed solution? Ask that question. In fact, I'd urge you as technologists to always ask that question. If people say, I want to do this, question number one should be, what's the problem to which this is the proposed solution? And finally, if you do it right, you'll get some great outcomes. So, happy microservices. And that's all I've got. Thank you very much.